Hello students. I am excited today to talk about chapter 10 of your textbook, the con concept of linear regression in what can only be described as the absolute best sweater of all time. So go ahead and admire. Uh, okay, but to the math. Uh, linear regression is all about understanding data. So how is linear regression supposed to help us understand data? Well, when we are trying to understand data, we ask a few questions. Um, in particular, when our data set, when we're just comparing two variables, we ask, what is the relationship between those variables? And how strong is that relationship? Now, when we are doing linear regression and we ask the question, what's the relationship between the two variables? If we're doing linear regression, we are assuming that the relationship is linear. And then a linear regression will tell you what line best fits the data. And we'll obviously do examples to make this clear, but this is just a high level overview. And then you say, okay, well, we assume the relationship is linear and then we look at a line that best fits the data. And then we can ask, how strong is the relationship? And this is where the values of R squared and R come in. They tell you how close the data is to that line of best fit. And uh, so both R squared and R both tell you how close the line is to the line, how close the data is, excuse me, to the line of best fit. And R, but since R squared is always positive, um, so it's kind of like a quick check. R itself can be positive or negative, and that gives you some extra information um, to tell you what kind of correlation you have. Do you have positive or negative correlation? But okay, let's look at some more, go into more detail. Let's look at an example. So suppose you're a scientist studying the spread of malaria in a specific region, region in Southeast Asia. As part of your research, you want to understand how air humidity affects local mosquito populations. Since mosquito bites are the main source of transmission of the disease, and local residents claim that mosquitoes are worse on humid days. Okay, you're a scientist looking at the relationship between humidity and mosquitoes, and so you collect data. This is the data you collect. Uh, what you do is you say set out a trap, uh, a mosquito trap, and every day you look at the relative humidity for that day, maybe take some average, and you also look at the number of mosquitoes you trapped in your trap that day, and you make a table of your data. So, okay, it looks like in this uh, example data set is the relative humidity was 60% and the number of mosquitoes trapped was 76 on that day. Next day, the humidity was 68% and the number of trapped mosquitoes was 90. Um, and you go on and notice that this data isn't uh, assembled in like a, uh, in any sort of order. So the, your input variables here, the humidity, oh sure it's 60, 68, 80, and then it bounces down to 50, 77, 55, and then comes back up. So, these aren't organized in any order. Um, probably the order was um, the time that you uh, checked these. But OK, you have this data set that you've got one variable on one side, another variable on the right side um, without any, too any particular organization to it. Um, and you want to understand this data. You want to understand how is the humidity affecting the number of mosquitoes in the air? And so one thing to do is just to plot all of these points on a graph. You do something like this. Um, this can be done in Google Sheets. And uh, in fact, your author made a great video on how to do this. Um, and so uh, I'm assuming that you have tried to read the textbook and uh, watched that video before coming to this one. Uh, but OK. So you've got your data, now you're plotting it. And uh, okay, even though your original data wasn't organized, uh, now your data is. It's Your points are organized from uh, the 
I guess, lowest humidity to highest humidity. Um, so they're ordered now in that way. And okay, you look at this and there's, all right, there's your data. And that looks like the data is kind of linear. Uh, I mean, it's not like the data kind of goes up and then goes back down or um, just, you know, is totally chaotic and spread out everywhere. It sort of seems like, well, as you go, if you as you increase the humidity, it does seem like the number of mosquitoes is increasing and kind of like you could draw a line through this that wouldn't be too bad. Um, so, okay, the relationship looks to you like it might be linear, so you're justified in trying to run a linear regression on it. And uh, you go to go, go, go to Google Sheets to do this. Um, in the past when I've taught this, I've had students worry, like, how do you do this by hand? And my answer is, oh, in this class, you will definitely not be doing it by hand. In a statistics class, you might um, be asked to do something by hand like once or twice just to build character but i mean statisticians aren't doing this by hand either they're they're using excel or something like that or r but okay so go to google sheets run your linear regression analysis definitely watch that video that your author made if you haven't yet but okay you run your linear regression analysis and what that does in google sheets is it actually gives you the line of best fit gives you this line right here. And you can, uh, and it'll even give you R squared. Uh, and I guess I didn't do this for this one, but if you um, get the settings right, you can also, it'll give you the equation for this line as well. And so what is this line? Well, we call it the trend line. And here's what it really is. This is what it's doing. This is the line. When I say the, it's the line that best fits the data, I mean, it is the line that makes the distance between the data and the line the smallest. So you like add up all of these distances um, for this line. And kind of theoretically, you take any possible line through the data and you add up all the distances between the data and the line. Of all the lines that are possible, this is the line that minimizes the total distance of the data to the distance of the line. And that's what we mean by the best fit. We mean, all right, well, the error, it's minimizing the error between the data and the line. And this actually sounds like a simple concept, but it is a real pain to actually uh, execute this correctly, um, which is why we're not covering the um, details of how the algorithm works. But just this is what the algorithm is doing. It's finding the line that does that. So, okay, that's the trend line. And then the value R squared tells you how well the line fits the data. And so R squared is always going to be between zero and one. And if R squared is closer to one, if R squared is larger, then the data fits the line better. So I guess the larger R the smaller these distances are. Um, the larger R squared is, that means the smaller those distances. Um, so yes, R squared large, i.e. close to one, then the trend line is a good fit for the data. And here R squared is 0.903, so yeah, it's, this is a good fit. And if the trend line fits the data poorly, then R squared is going to be small, um, closer to zero. And the whole reason you would do something like linear regression, I mean, <laughs> up to this point, you're like, okay, that's cute. We have put a line there. Uh, good for us. Why would we ever do that? And the reason we would ever do that is because the whole point is to be making predictions. Is we want to say, all right, well, is it, you know, maybe you know that, oh, on days when you trap more than 60 mosquitoes, those are days when uh, it disease, that's like the concentration that ends up uh, being correlated with the disease uh, getting spread rapidly. Uh, and so you, yeah, you might be interested in saying, all right, well, then 
what levels of humidity end up becoming dangerous levels. Um, and that's what you use this trend line for is to say, uh, is to like make predictions about, all right, if you know the humidity, you can predict the number of mosquitoes you might find. Or if you find certain number of mosquitoes in your trap, you might be able to go back and uh, have make a good guess about what the humidity was on that day. Um, in particular, you use this line to make guesses in situations where you don't already have data. And the, the idea is that, well, if you don't have data at some point, then your best guess is just going to be whatever the trend line tells you. So let's suppose, for example, that the relative humidity on some day is 72%. Make a prediction about how many mosquitoes you would expect to trap. And to do that, all right, well, we just check the line and say, all right, well, if we, let's say, relative humidity is about 72% throughout here. Then you go up here and the trend line says, all right, well, if the trend line were the truth, uh, the number of mosquitoes you would trap would be about 100. And it could have gone the other way. I could have said, oh, if you trapped 100 mosquitoes, then uh, what's the, what would you expect the relative humidity to be? And you say, all right, well, at 100 mosquitoes, um, I would expect the relative humidity to have been about 72%. And now I'm just doing this by actually looking at the line, but if you had the equation for the line here, which I only mildly regret not having, um, but yeah, if you had the equation for the line here, then you could use the equation. You'd like say, all right, well, it's some function of x, and you would plug in 72% for x, and the output would tell you the number of mosquitoes you would have expected to trap. So yeah, you could use this line either by looking at it directly or by using the equation for the line, which contains the same information, and plugging values into the equation, and then you don't have to guess, you can get exact answers. All right. Uh, I want to spend a little time talking about the difference between R and R squared, because um, in my experience, even students who have in the past, um, you know, read the textbook thoroughly have still found this to be a sticking point for them. So, okay, so R squared is always positive, and it's a quick way of seeing how well variables in the data set are correlated. And in particular, it's nice for comparing two different data sets because you're just taking one positive number, comparing it to another positive number. If you look at the R squared for two data sets, and then you could say, okay, this R squared is larger. This is a better fit for the trend line um, than this other data set. And so R squared, it's nice that it's positive. Always, it makes it easier to compare different data sets, but it doesn't contain as much information as the value R. So R, is just the square root of r squared. So in one sense, like how can it not, how does it not contain the same information if it's just a square root? But every number, every positive number has two square roots. It's got a positive square root and a negative square root. So which one do you take? I mean, and in fact, r can be positive or negative. If r is positive, that means that the trend line has a positive slope, which means like, oh, if you increase your inputs, your outputs also increase. A negative trend line means you have a negative slope in your uh, data. So increase in your inputs results in a decrease in the outputs. So, all right. So let's look at these two graphs. They have the same R squared value. What's the value of R for each of these graphs? Well, for this first one, the slope is positive, so R must be positive. So take the square root of 0.903, you get 0 0.950, and you get, uh, and you wanna, because the slope is positive, you wanna take the positive, square root of r, and you get 0 
here. All right, the r squared is the same, 0.903, but the slope is negative, so you want to take the negative square root. So the r here is negative 0 0.950. Now, of course, your calculator will give you the positive square root every time, and so you have to think, you have to know your data set and look at the correlation and use that to decide whether or not um, the value is, um, whether or not to use the positive or negative value here. Okay. And then, okay, if you have R, then we can uh, be a little bit more explicit about what um, kind of, uh, or how well the relationship of the trend line is to the data. Um, we say, uh, all right, if we have these ranges of R, this is just a table I pulled straight out of your book. Um, so R squared was between zero and one, but R is between negative one and positive one. In negative values of R, we say we have negative correlation. And if it's if R is pretty close to negative one, then it's a strong negative correlation. And if it's kind of not that close, but kind of close, <laughs> we say moderate negative. Um, here, if it's in this range, okay, it's weakly negative. And if R is zero means, all right, the data seems like it's not correlated at all. Um, and then, okay, on the other side, if your R is positive, then you're going to get positive correlations. Um, so yeah, this isn't, I mean, you don't have to do any memorizing in this class. So don't memorize this, but this is going to be something you're going to want to refer to when doing the practice problems in the homework. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the idea of correlation versus causation and how they are different. So, okay, um, sorry, let me go back one. Uh, so in this, we are back in the humidity versus mosquitoes situation. And so, all right, you've got your data set up, you've got this trend line, the trend line, the R squared is high, the R is high. You have a strong positive correlation in this data set. Does this prove that an increase in mosquitoes causes an increase in humidity? Does this prove that an increase in humidity causes, wait, an increase in mosquitoes? Ah, now I tripped myself up. Uh, okay. So yeah, this first question, does it prove that an increase in mosquitoes causes an increase in humidity? Let's go back. Uh, I think everyone is right to say absolutely not. Um, it's hard to imagine how increasing mosquitoes could like change the climate in a certain region. So, all right, this is maybe an obvious no. Well, what about the other way around? Does uh, a strong positive correlation prove that an increase in humidity causes an increase in mosquitoes. And I'm this, the instinct is, yeah, it does prove that. But I wanna say that the analysis by itself doesn't tell you anything. Like all it tells you is that these variables are strongly correlated. It doesn't tell you anything about the direction of causation. Like the correlation by itself doesn't tell you anything about the direction of causation. But, okay, maybe you have an independent reason for believing that an increase in humidity causes an increase in the mosquito population. So you've got some independent theory. Like maybe you think, okay, look, mosquito eggs need moisture to survive long enough to hatch. Um, and so there, there's your theory. Okay, mosquito eggs need moisture, so you believe that an increase in humidity humidity should cause an increase in the number of mosquitoes. And so given that theory, then you go out and collect data, and the data does lend support to this independent theory. But the data by itself, like this trend line, this correlation, even like knowing it's a strong correlation, all of that by itself doesn't tell you anything about causation. You have to have an independent reason for thinking one direction, you've got causality somewhere. And then this kind of analysis can lend support to that. Uh, and we'll see kind of a related example here about 
why it's important to separate these ideas of correlation and causation. So here, uh, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. Here we've got a, uh, we're graphing two variables, shark attacks and ice cream scales, uh, ice cream sales, uh, charting those two variables um, over time in a given year. And it seems like these two variables are moving in tandem with each other. It seems like they're probably correlated. I mean, but if you did a, yeah, if you plotted ice cream sales versus shark attacks, you would, and did a linear regression, I bet you'd get a really strong correlation. So does that mean that ice cream sales cause shark attacks? Or does that mean that shark attacks cause ice cream sales? No, of course not. Nothing about buying ice cream makes you get attacked by a shark. So is there something else in the background here causing both? Yeah, I think so. Probably temperature. If we look at this, okay, when it's cold, we don't have a lot of ice cream sales and we don't have a lot of shark attacks. And that makes a lot of sense because if it's cold, you're not going in the ocean. But all right, in the summer months, as it gets hotter and hotter, people are going to the beach, people are buying ice cream. And so really what we have is not causation either direction. There's something else in the background causing both of these things. And so this is often called the problem of lurking variables or the problem of confounding variables where um, you have, oh, in reality, there's just something else going on entirely that explains the correlation. And so the fact that these two variables are strongly correlated, that's compatible with neither of them causing the other one. So that's something to be aware of. Okay, takeaways. Linear regression gives you the line of best fit for a data set. This is sometimes called the trend line. And this trend line is used to make predictions. That's why we do this. The values of both R and R squared can tell you how well the data matches the trend line. R, if it's positive, that means that the trend line has positive slope. And in that case, we say that the variables are positively correlated. If R is negative, the trend line has a negative slope and we say that the variables are negatively correlated. And for the love of God, don't ever make the mistake of thinking that correlation implies causation because we just saw two variables could be correlated and neither one causes the other. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this video and this sweater.